This is the time of year where we clean out our attics, out with the old, in with the new. And I'm glad that it's finally 2024, because 2023 just never seemed right to me. It's just an odd number, 2023. 2025 is going to be easier to remember, although some of you maybe like me, occasionally when you start to fill up the date on something, start with a 19. Have you ever, have you ever done that? I mean, way behind uh, the times. 2024, a brand new year. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about New Year's Day floats or New Year's Day bowl games, but it does talk a little bit about New Year's. A lot of important things happened on the first day of the first month of the year. That's when the flood started. That's also when the tabernacle was dedicated. It, the temple began its construction on New Year's Day, and Ezra began his journey from Babylon back to Jerusalem. So New Year's Day can be something very important. This is 2024. We don't know where this road is going to lead us, but if we're going to go with God, then one thing is certain, we've got to let him be in control. Uh, Jesus can't just be our co-pilot when we get in trouble. He's got to be in the driver's seat all the time. He's got to lead the way. It is not in man that walks to to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. When we try to direct our steps, we end up literally and figuratively lost, right? Right? So we have to live. Now, understand that if you really do give <coughs> control over uh, to God, then um, he'll lead you some places you might not want to go in. I heard uh, somebody say one time that we really don't want the Holy Spirit to show up in church because he hardly ever does things decently in order. You know, when we truly turn our lives over to God, it's no telling what God is going to do, where God is going to lead us. Jeremiah says in the very next verse, Discipline me, Lord, but only in due measure, not in your anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. Jeremiah understood that if God does direct our steps, there's going to be times when we go through some hard times, some discipline times, some times where God is allowing us to learn some hard lessons. I mean, Jeremiah, after all, was the weeping prophet. He went through some of those difficult times. Sometimes God leads us where we don't want to go. Remember when uh, Peter is being uh, reinstated as one of Christ's apostles after his denial. Jesus, three times, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And he does that three times. And then he says this in John 21, verse 18. Very truly, I tell you, When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Jesus uses this analogy of getting older when the older we get, the more feeble we get. By the way, I meant to mention this. Uh, Richard, we put this microphone on the floor so that old and feeble people don't have to climb up the... No, I'm just kidding. Um, When you get old, you lose a a, a level of a a, a part of your self-determination. You've got to let other people do things that you used to do for yourself. And and, uh, people will lead you maybe where you do not want to go. And Jesus uses that to warn Peter, if you follow me then that's going to be in some places where you're not counting on, talking about the way that Peter was going to be martyred. But the point is, he tells Peter, follow me. And he tells each of us today to give him control of our lives, even if that means him leading us where we do not want to go. Einstein, The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Einstein didn't say that. You know, you take something that's clever and you attribute it to somebody really smart and it becomes even more clever. Uh, Now, in fact, uh, from what I could determine, that was a quote from a Rita Mae Brown book back in the 60s that uh, somehow got attributed to Einstein. But I think it stands on its own. If you continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, uh, that's just not wise. 
And if we want to draw closer and closer to God, then we can't just continue to do the same things. If you want 2024 to be a better year for yourself spiritually, then you might want to look back at some of the things you did in 2023 and do a few things different. And that's why uh, occasionally we'll try something different as a church together. We're trying to emphasize the reading of the Bible uh, daily on the part of our members, and we're doing that through this daily Bible reading of the New Testament. David sent you an invitation. Uh, Some of you, about 35 or so people have already doing it, and we hope everyone will. We'll send out the invitation again uh, this week. We're using the U version of the Bible in order to keep us kind of together as we read, where we, we comment on the reading, everybody gets to see that. If you're not apt to use an app, however, we're going to print those same readings in the bulletin each week. And we want to encourage everyone to make the commitment to do uh, at least something different for a lot of us, and that is make sure we spend time in Scripture just a little bit each day. Since we're reading the New Testament together, it won't take you long, it'll be five minutes to ten minutes, uh, depending how long you read, maybe 30 minutes if you're going to thumb out one of those replies because some of us don't type as fast uh, as others. But let's keep this commitment to read Scripture together each, each day. The Bible talks a lot about, and I was kind of holding my breath a little bit, Richard, because you were getting close to some of these same verses that I was going to use today, but that's okay. Repetition is good, right? The Bible talks about new a lot. God places a new song. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. May Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. This is right after he talks about God picking him out of the mire and giving him a firm place to stand. And because now God has saved him and given him a place to stand, he's got this new song of praise. God promises to give us a new heart, Ezekiel 36 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God wants to renew us and give us new hearts that are more dedicated to him. In fact, he wants to make us a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. God is constantly recreating us. Jesus talks about new wineskins. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. The gospel is the continually bubbling, fermenting brew that continues to stretch and to change us. And if we deeply imbibe of this gospel, it will continue to transform us. We can't become brittle. We can't become stiff. We've got to be ever made new. Now, Jesus says, and I understand There's going to be some people that don't appreciate new. They want the old. In fact, he says in the very next verse, and no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. Sometimes we get stuck in the same old ruts and we're comfortable and we don't want to get out of those ruts because we think the old is better. In fact, sometimes we even use the Bible to, uh, uh, to justify that stuck in the old. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Sometimes we say, we can't can't go off into anything new because we've got to stand in the old paths. Years ago, we had a preacher's meeting where I, uh, we, we, we tried to get multiple people involved each week. Somebody make, giving a presentation, somebody sharing a sermon outline, somebody doing a, a, um, a book review. Um, see, the more people you get involved, we, that way we'd have at least three people show up. So that's what we were doing. And so I was in charge of it one month, and I asked one of the brothers to do a book review. Older preacher. <clears throat> I mean, he was really old. He was so old, he was probably about my age that I am now. And I asked him, well, why don't you do a book review for us next month, brother? And he looked at me, serious as a heart attack, and said, book review? I haven't read a book in 40 years except the Bible. You know, sometimes it's comfortable. We like believing what we believe. We like being what we are. And to get stretched and changed, that gets uncomfortable. But God is constantly working on us. He cannot give us that new heart that Ezekiel promised. He can't create in us a new creation that Paul talked about. 
unless he changes us and gets us out of our ruts. The text I want to look at this morning is where God declares new things. Uh, It is one of those messianic texts from Isaiah, and he's going to talk about the new things that he declares, and he's going to edge at some of the newness in us. So let's listen to the word of the Lord as Isaiah declares it in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See. The former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. New things I declare. God is going to make everything new. Isaiah pointing to the time of the Messiah. And of course, we know that this is talking about Jesus. In fact, Jesus takes these words and applies them to himself. In Matthew 12, he uses the same imagery we just heard. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out until he has brought justice through to victory. A bruised reed he will not break. The the reed that's being talked about is kind of a, a long, straight, hollow plant, kind of like bamboo, that was so straight it was used for measuring, it got so big it could be used as a walking stick. But if it got bent a little bit, bruised a little bit, all of its strength was gone, and it would have to be discarded and thrown away. When the girls were little, this time of year was fun because a lot of times they would, rather than playing with the toys they were given, they would still be playing with the tubes from the wrapping paper. They would become swords, maybe later lightsabers, and they would fight each other. But as soon as one of those got bent, it stopped being a sword and started being a whip, you know, you're flapping around. Until finally, you know, Angeline would get upset and she would go grab a plastic baseball bat. And that's what she would use, you know, sort of thing. So what Jesus is saying, or what Isaiah is saying is the Messiah would be so gentle and so interested in renewing that which was broken, he would not discard the bruised reed, but rather renew it. He would not snuff out the smoldering wick. Uh, lamps, they didn't have candles in, in those days. They didn't get created until the Middle Ages. They used, in fact, that's one of the things I've wondered about in watching The Chosen. They constantly have candles. Those weren't invented back in Jesus' day. They used little clay bowls that uh, were pinched at one end, filled with olive oil, and then a flax wick was placed in it. And you light the wick, and it would burn the oil. It would work fine until the oil ran out. And when the oil ran out, the wick would start to burn, and that was what would smolder. And then you have to start over again, throw away that wick, get new oil and a new flax, and, and, and start the lamp all over again. But the Messiah would come. He would be one that would not snuff out the smoldering wick, but would renew it. Isaiah is um, speaking of Israel. Um, Israel, as God's people, were broken. They were the broken reed, constantly broken by their unfaithfulness and their insistence at chasing after other gods, like we saw in our study of the book of Judges. They were about as useful to God as a smoldering wick. 
But when the Messiah came, he would change everything. He would make everything new. He would recreate out of his broken people a people that were useful and used in his service. The Messiah would make everything new. So Isaiah begins, uh, ends this section by saying, See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. New things I declare. And that's what God declares into our lives today. Isaiah, we call the Messianic prophet. As even though Isaiah spoke to the situation and con historical context of Israel in the 8th century BC, he was also speaking of a time that was coming. Many of his prophecies not only spoke to Israel, but spoke beyond Israel till the time of the Messiah. And so some people refer to Isaiah as the fifth gospel. And so he would declare that the time was coming when God would step into human history, the promised one, the, the one that Moses called a prophet like me, the one that all of the prophets talked about and pointed to, the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed of God would come and he would make everything new. But the way that he would make everything new was amazing. He wasn't what Israel was expecting and Actually, it wasn't what Israel wanted. They perceived of a Messiah that would come as a conquering king that would destroy their enemies and resurrect the empire of David and Solomon. But that's not the Messiah that Isaiah talks about here. This Messiah would not shout or, or make a fuss in the streets, right? He would not be a revolutionary. But what he would do would be revolutionary. He would make all things New. And he would do that by becoming the suffering servant that would give himself. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. You see, the reason that the Messiah would not discard the broken reed was because he himself would be broken. And the reason he would not snuff out the uh, damaged smoking flax is that he would make everything new by taking our iniquities and sins upon himself at a high price to himself. He would be crushed for us. The Messiah would give himself to us for us so that we could become new again. That was the promise of the Messiah and the promise of Christ. We stand here at the starting line of this brand new year. We don't know what this year is going to be. We don't know if we're in a sprint or a marathon. Perhaps some of us standing at the starting line of this new year won't be here for the ending of it. We don't know how long that we have. But we've been given this race to run and we must run it. And as we stand here ready to start, what might be on our minds is not the victorious finish of the race, but rather the fact that we stand here as broken reeds and smoking flaxes. What we might remember, you know, about a year ago, we started a new year, 2023, and we made some New Year's resolutions. And what we may be painfully aware of this morning is the unfulfilled resolutions, the broken promises that we made to God to be better in this new year than in the old. We come before God as broken people, as bruised reeds and smoking flaxes. We may have gotten to the point where perhaps we've given up. We may even go through the... I mean, have you ever done that? Started a diet... Knowing, okay, this is January the 7th. How many of us, don't raise your hand, please, because we're going to have a potluck right after we're done today, right? How many decided, this is the year I'm going to lose weight? And even as you made that promise to yourself, you knew you probably weren't going to follow it through because you've made that promise so many times before. Yes, we are all broken, 
But we're all broken before a God who promises to make us new, to give us that new heart, and to create in us a new creation. Even if you've given up on yourself, know that God has not. That God believes that you can become that new creation. That God wants to infuse you with his spirit and create in you something that is brand new and different and unique. Even when we don't believe that that is possible ourselves, we need to believe that God can do that as we become these new creatures in God's service. God has given you a brand new year. It's up to you to know what it is that you're going to do with it. You can't allow your past failures to handicap and handcuff you and keep you from doing all that God wants you to do. Or you can decide to let Christ's light relight that smoking flax that has flickered and gone out. God wants to make you new this year. He wants to recreate in you that clean heart. And he wants to start today. Let's pray together.